next panel discussion. This one is actually very special, and it's entitled, How to Reach a Million Hearts and Make an Impact. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator and co-organizer again, Gal Smola from Miller-Thompson. Gal. Hi there. My uh, dear panelists, would you like to join me? Do I have any panelists? Okay, we have some no-shows I saw from David Drake. But other than that, it should be good. Um, so just a brief introduction. Uh, would everybody, maybe from the end, I'll start with a brief just introduction about yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew D'Souza. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur and investor in the Toronto and Silicon Valley ecosystem for a while. Uh, most recently started a company called ClearBank, which is a um, fintech company focused on financing small business and e-commerce businesses to grow their marketing and ad budget. Uh, started the company with Michelle Romano from Dragon's Den, who you, some of you guys may know if you're Canadian. Um, and we are also uh, launching a, a decentralized project called the Forward Network, which we can talk about a little bit, but essentially uh, allows for global um, issuance of debt and equity for small businesses who typically don't have access to, uh, to some of these, these assets. Um, and investors globally to be able to invest in, in high growth small businesses um, and businesses like ClearBank to be able to be underwriters on that platform. So that's, uh, I'm excited to talk about impact investing and, uh, and having an impact using, using the blockchain. Thank you, Andrew. Hi everyone, my name is Tracy Leperulo. I run a company called Untraceable. I got involved in crypto back in 2011 when I went to Kenya. I started a microfinance program in financial literacy and really got involved in the Toronto tech community here and the, and the blockchain community. Um, so I ran the first Bitcoin Expo and the first Ethereum event and was really close with the Ethereum team pre, uh, pre even before they went live. And uh, recently the Futures Conference and do these really big mega kind of conferences and advisory helping out uh, blockchain companies start up. Hi, I'm back. Everyone, my name is Heidi, and I'm the CEO of Busto. So Busto is a decentralized application marketplace. We provide tools and libraries. Developers can build dApps. The influencers can referral them out, and everybody can make money on top of that. So we're a competitor of iOS Store and Google Play. Other than that, we also have our accelerator in Silicon Valley, and we have a bunch of projects that are using our protocol to build their dApps. Um, besides that, we also have a media called Busto Media, and I'm also a YouTuber called Crypto Heidi, so you guys can go to YouTube and follow me and watch my videos. A lot of my fans are investors and projects, very to be oriented. Also, you guys can find me on LinkedIn if you want to talk about your projects and anything you want to share about. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt. Uh, I've been in technology for over 20 years uh, in various capacities, building products as well as doing service work. Uh, as also been in hospitality, uh, both here and in the United States. Uh, I currently work for CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company. Thank you very much for paying my salary, everybody here. And um, I do not have a YouTube channel, although you're so cool, I'm gonna I'm gonna get one starting tomorrow. <laughs> I could be your agent. <laughs> I'll work on it. Thanks. Um, so my name is Gal Smoller. I'm a lawyer at Miller Thompson. Uh, this is not going to be a legal subject. We're not going to talk about ICOs or any regulation. Um, I'm qualified as a lawyer in Canada and in Israel. I'm half Finnish, half Israeli. I've been in tech probably like you almost 18 years. Uh, represent entrepreneurs, angel investors, variety areas of technology. Um, and so kind of I want to follow up a bit on the um, the video we saw earlier from Tim Draper, he was talking about you know the evolution of the internet and our blockchain, and and so maybe just each of you, uh, I'm curious to know kind of um, 
again, out of the kind of the day-to-day -day application world, kind of on a more higher level or more holistic level, where is this taking us? What kind of efficiencies? Um, uh, what, what do you see in this kind of the next wave of technology? How, how is it going to change actual things in terms of kind of from a high level perspective? So we'd like to start. Sure, yeah, look, I think um, the exciting thing about blockchain is it, it forces uh, accountability across, uh, across multiple ecosystems, right? So we work with a lot of e-commerce businesses uh, and if you're an e-commerce business, you know, Amazon, Google, Facebook kind of hold the cards of, of how you operate your business, how you find your customers. Um, I think what's exciting, uh, and then you know your bank or your venture capital holds the cards around your your uh, your access to capital and how you grow the business. Um, what I think is exciting about blockchain is it allows people to flip that narrative and go back and say, actually, I'm going to hold the cards, and if I act in the best interests of the entire ecosystem, the entire network, I'm going to be rewarded. So you can think about that, you know, in a, in multiple different dimensions. We think about it from a financial services perspective, but you can think about it from a you know attention. Um, an advertising perspective, you can think about it from a supply chain perspective, uh, you can think about it from an access to data perspective, but I think this this shift from the sort of oligopolistic, uh, you know, massive, whether we think about the Canadian banking system, whether we think about the ad networks and the major sort of uh, consumer advertising platforms, um, you're getting, you get these like oligopolistic sort of price fixing behaviors when everybody gets big and nobody really wants to compete, um, and I think the blockchain uh, completely breaks those down uh, and allows for much more innovation and much more rapid innovation um, if we can get past some of the challenges around you know scaling and you know the technical challenges which are always always there um, there's a really exciting future on the other side Trace, did you want to sure so so as it relates to social impact overall yeah go for it. Yeah, I think blockchain uh, plays a really interesting role in how social impact projects are going to be uh, continued to do. So the obvious one is is charity, right? So right now we give money to charities. We don't know where it goes, who's actually taking it, what percentage. So being able to trace it allows us to actually know where our donations are going. I think when it comes down to more of the social impact type of projects, they're radically changing all the different type of sustainability goals for the United Nations right now. And so... There's so many really cool projects related to saving the environment, social impact, remittance, um, and really just helping leveling out the playing field, which is an interesting concept. Because when I first got into crypto, uh, really, when I, when I ran the first Bitcoin Expo in Canada, it was all libertarians, it was all anarchists, it was all social entrepreneurs. There really wasn't anybody from a bank, or they were, but they just were, were not wearing a suit. You would never find anybody wearing a suit back in the day talking about Bitcoin. Um, and a lot of it was focused around how do we bring the unbanked? How do we actually help people in the third world countries um, uh, kind of level the playing field? Because everyone, all these middlemen are taking all these little, you know, percentages off of every transaction. And so um, it's, I think there's been a lot of really good projects in social impact. And I think it's just blockchain more than any, I think in all the industries, blockchain is going to change social impact uh, incredibly. So I, I really think blockchain stuff has two parts. One is as blockchain technology. Another one is just crazy cryptocurrency. Those are awesome stuff. Like crypto, oh no, okay. Blockchain technology, so back seven, seven years, 10 years ago, those are mobile technology was there. It's kind of really cool. Before that was dot com, but however, dot com time, a lot of people here super young, not really can participate yet. But however, now blockchain gets a lot of open source things. So we build things much faster and everybody can participate in the whole process, which is super, super cool. This is the technology part, definitely cut the middleman and get everything, transparency, charity things, and a lot of applications can be, have more imaginations over there. Uh, also cryptocurrency, just how crazy last year was. And still people are expecting more coming later. So get more people get involved and people are just so crazy about this, not just crypto, uh, blockchain, both, and there's so many imaginations uh, going over there, so definitely I see the... So let me just ask you, so what is it in, in this that brings it to more people? What, what, you know, we heard about like transability or remittance, trust is a big word I hear a lot when I talk to people about it. What, what's the big kind of, the key aspect of the technology that allows it to be delivered to more and more people? Delivered to normal people? Average more people. to more people? What do you mean? Like, 
cryptocurrency people, more people will use it? Or? No, but I, like even your presentation earlier, so you were mentioning there about like views and videos. and So is there something in the technology that kind of allows it to reach a broader audience than, than current or past or technologies? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that we saw when, you know, as the internet has grown and and started to really flourish with platform applications is is this level of abstraction that you get from various types of platform tools. We talked a little bit about tools today. You, you've got some tools that you're working with, and and the earlier presentation was all about it. And you you think about like where did all these startups come from, like Twitter and Airbnb, that that, that just came out of of the gates and were able to grow very quickly. And it's it's technology like, let's say, Ruby on Rails and, and, and all the node stuff that allowed people without, like, that weren't super, super technical to be able to build things very quickly. And, and I think with, with blockchain, we're, we're starting to see some of that come around now. I think it's still very early. And, you know, given that we have a real lack of, of, of talent in terms of supply, right now in the market for building things, it's very hard to justify moving forward on some of these projects just, just because there's nobody to do the, do the work because the work takes so long. And I think as we see more of these tools come around, we're really gonna be able to just say, oh, I don't have to think about the fact that it's blockchain. I can just build something really cool that audiences will love that happens to run on blockchain. And I think that's gonna be a big game changer uh, wherever that comes from. Yeah, definitely. That's Definitely, we see more collaborations right nowadays because everybody's open and they can use anybody else's stuff and build their own components and make the whole thing. It's more like a Lego, that toy. You can have your own piece and find other pieces to make your own. So, like before, people have to develop a lot of things vertical by themselves. But now it's, it's a flat and they can in, 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 just have more engagement with other development developers. And talking about increasing the audience and the crowd, we have another panelist here. So do you want to introduce yourself just briefly? Hi, uh, Michael Gord, founder of MLG. Subbing in for David as of this morning. Um, yeah, we do turnkey execution for token sales, enterprise, government, startup consulting. Uh, worked on more than 20 token sales, advised on more than $200 million of capital raised. Um, yeah, high level. And can I start with a question? Can I? Yeah, what's the yeah. What's So the uh, on social, we kind of touched a bit on social uh, impact and project. Do you have any examples of projects that you are working on that? Yeah, so social, social impact projects, I would kind of break up into high level two different ways that blockchains are helping with social initiatives. The first is uh, how tokens are powering social initiatives. So for example, we've worked with companies like Lala World that are partnered with uh, many governments across Asia and, and across the world to provide a, a token uh, an identity, a remittance system, uh, banking, banking infrastructure for, for migrants and the unbanked. Uh, so as millions of people, as millions of migrants travel across Asia with no identity, no access to financial infrastructure, uh, no access to a cell phone or anything, they get a Lala starting kit that uh, provides them with all of this infrastructure when they get to the new place. So they're able to have an identity and have bank infra infrastructure and everything they need to start a new life in the new country. Um, Super cool. They have millions of people that have that have joined the network in the past year since the launch. Uh, so really exciting project. And then uh, on the other side, there's um, existing enterprises, governments, and uh, nonprofit organizations that are using blockchains to power social initiatives without tokenizing it. Uh, so for example, we uh, we worked with uh, Dominion Mining, uh, Dominion Bitcoin Mining Corporation to help set up a. Uh, donation platform for Mount Sinai in Toronto to accept Bitcoin. Um, and then there's examples of like the, the Red Cross uh, using blockchains to power, uh, to power initiatives in, in places like Heidi and to have transparency and have certainty into where the capital is or the, the donation capital is, is going. Um, and then there's examples of governments around the world that are using blockchains to um, to create transparency in their in their countries, uh, so a really exciting example from the government level is, uh, is Uzbekistan is right now in the process of of uh, of privatizing all of the government-owned buildings and infrastructure in the country, and 
Um, they're in the process of creating a new protocol that instead of, uh, whereas in Russia, when, when they had this exercise about 10 years ago, um, and the, the stuff was only for sale to a select group of what is now referred to as the, as the oligarchs, uh, Uzbekistan is putting everything for sale on, their, on this new protocol that they're building. Um, so that's a really exciting project that, that we're working on with one of our portfolio companies in Uzbekistan. Thanks. Um, now, and part of our mandate here with this uh, major topic uh, was to each of us to tell a good story uh, about, um, about these um, kind of recurring themes. So uh, again, we mentioned trust, um, um, ownership of data I think is a big thing uh, that, uh, that I think many realized that in the previous round everybody was ready to give up quite a lot of their privacy in exchange for free content. Nowadays I think that's probably going to change a bit. So just of each one of you some kind of a story that kind of highlights some of these uh, uh, recurring um, um, themes. I know uh, Matt we spoke earlier you mentioned traceability. Did you want to maybe mention that in terms of um, stuff that you see? Sure, I, I'll, I'll be quick. I don't want to be a mic hog. Uh, I, know, I know not everybody's gotten to speak a lot. Um, so aside from technology work, I actually worked as a chef for a good number of years in some very well-known overpriced restaurants in the United States and, and in Toronto. And one of, the, one of the challenges we have when you're sourcing ingredients and assembling dishes uh, you know, especially in the higher end restaurants is that you're getting things from different places. Uh, different vendors and you don't always know where that stuff comes from and you know you get a batch of onions that comes in with salmonella poisoning on it and all of a sudden everybody's not feeling so well and you really want to be able to say where did this come from you know and be able to trace it back and what we have right now is 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 fair but it's it's very paper driven and that paper gets lost very easily in restaurant kitchens and so I look at like the pilot that uh, I think Walmart is doing with IBM to establish, you know, what is the source of, of stuff on their shelves in, in the food areas. And I, I think this is just a great, a great way to be able to help prevent some of these problems from happening, right? Not necessarily to the people who have already gotten sick, but who else bought that food? Where did it come from? What else is contaminated? And where is all that stuff going? And to be able to flag that very quickly. Uh, so that's something I'm looking forward to personally. I, uh, Crypto Heidi. Crypto Heidi had an interview yesterday with Binance. Do you guys know Binance? OK, yeah. So yeah. Other than the other exchange. So they have a new initiative called um, Binance Charity right now. So definitely a lot of social applications will be in the charity industry. So how that will work is the uh, have the platform so people can go there to make sure all their donations to the people will go to exactly that person and also how that person use their funds to use what and and what's the result of doing that. So I, I think that's really interesting. It's similar to this tracing the source, the, the source right? and how it's used to, to, to get, it, get it out there and what is the RI, what is the KPI. It's really interesting. Yeah, on that note, I think I read about a company that allows musicians to donate part of their royalty into charity and track where actually it ends yeah. up. So, yeah, for sure. Okay, so story. So, so the panel is how to reach a million hearts and make an impact as a reason. So I, I think one of the biggest things um, from my experience going to the developing world is how do we identify who those million hearts are? I think that's the first fundamental we have to figure out. And so I went to Kenya thinking I'm going to bring all this great financial literacy and all these great skills and I actually got really sick there. And when I got really sick I realized I didn't care about anything else other than getting better. And so I think a big thing to really make an impact on the world is the focus on how do we create better healthcare, how do we get cleaner water, and I think a blockchain is really improving this, but fundamentally right now it's improving the, the talk of identity. So how do we make sure everyone has an identity? And you, it's actually quite ast astonishing around the world how people don't know their birthday, how people don't have a yearly calendar. Um, so I think identity will be the biggest thing that needs to, that's going to really, really change an impact on health, which is going to um, indirectly change an impact on a lot of things. The other one is voting. Voting is a really big thing in how to make an impact, and it's not there yet, but we will find a way to make that work with blockchain. Um, and so I think at the end of the day, one of your first questions of what's so great about 
uh, blockchain. So my company is called Untraceable, but I definitely the traceability of it is one of the best proven things. Um, and so the fact that you can actually don't have to trust and you know don't have to worry about a uh, corrupted government. Don't have to worry about you know uh, corporates maybe corporations doing something that's more maybe maybe not the same intentions as you helps out. But in order to reach a million hearts, truthfully, it has to do with partnerships. It has to do with collaboration. Some of the most highly impactful social projects use the, you know companies like Coca Cola to go global because they actually have a distribution network. So I think um, I think once corporations and individuals and governments all work together, that's how it's all really going to skyrocket. Um, great. So I, I think what, what's really exciting is empowering sort of uh, local entrepreneurs, wherever they may be, to reach global markets. So if you think about, like imagine an entrepreneur in a high interest rate environment, a high inflation environment like Argentina uh, or India or somewhere like that. They have a great product, they want to sell it, um, but their costs go up by 13% a year because that's the inflation in that country. Um, if you're just selling your product to people around you, you can pass those costs on because that's the inflation in the environment. Now, if you're selling your product globally to a place like Japan or Switzerland um, or Sweden where there's super low or negative interest rates, those customers are not going to be willing to take, uh, take that cost increase and that inflation increase. And so what do you do? Um, and so that's one of the big challenges, I think, with you know a lot of uh, entrepreneurs being able to sell globally uh, is is around how do you manage pricing, how do you manage forex, how do you how do you continue to fund the growth in your business uh, when the local banks are charging a crazy high interest rate um, just to maintain, maintain inflation, and your customers are global and are willing to, to take that on. So um, this is part of what we're excited about creating you know these, these global uh, you know global opportunities for people to invest in businesses globally, buy products globally, um, and for entrepreneurs to get access to capital to, to scale their business, regardless of where they sit and what their current kind of financial system, uh, banks, you know, whether they're, uh, whether they're good actors or not, whether they're financially stable or not. Um, if you're a great entrepreneur with a great idea and a great product, why don't you be able to go and scale that um, you know, to, to the entire world? So let me just ask you a kind of a follow-up question. Um, and it, I think it was a cover on The Economist from about a week ago about the movement of, uh, of some of the technology entrepreneurship out of Silicon Valley to other places around the world. So obviously blockchain is really truly global. In the, I've been a tech lawyer for many years and it's always been very global, but with blockchain even more so. Um, so do you see that shifting? Do you see kind of new areas of R&D developing outside of yeah. Silicon Valley? Absolutely. Look, I think there's a, I think there's a whole new breed of entrepreneurs who are just rejecting this idea that I need to go to Silicon Valley and I need to go and like, you know, pray to the Silicon Sand Hill Road gods for my capital. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's empowering to say, look, there's, there are, there's sources of capital. There's people who are who believe in me, and it, it's not just a hundred thousand people or whatever, ten thousand people on one road in Silicon Valley anymore. And I don't need to play this game, and I don't need to go keep going back and giving up. 20 and 30 percent of my company every two or three years, uh, where by the time I actually build something of value, I don't own any of it, and they just tell me what to do. Right? I think the uh, you know that that game has been played for the last few decades, and I think entrepreneurs and ambitious entrepreneurs are are tired of it. So um, I think blockchain is accelerating. I think there's an there's you know I've noticed this in the last 10 years. There's been an undercurrent and a bit of a backlash, and people saying, hey, I want I want to do things differently. And over the last two years, blockchain is, um, has, has unleashed that, right? And so, so I think there's, a, there's been this undercurrent, and now all of a sudden there's this catalyst that is, oh, yeah, I don't have to move. I don't have to play by those rules. I just have to go and build something awesome, and you know, the capital and the access and the distribution will come. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah. Um, so I'll first answer the question, and then, and then give a story. So how would you reach, it, like, in... You know, very, very specifically, how do you reach a million? How do you reach millions of people? Um, so I think there's two routes to go to market. There's business. There's B 2 C and there's B 2 B. I think any blockchain business today that is reaching millions of people and any of our clients and the projects that we're engaged with that are reaching millions of people are going to the B 2 B route or B 2 B 2 C routes. Um, so I think if you're trying to sign up or you're trying to bring millions of people to millions of consumers to adapt today, I think it's impossible. Uh, because there's not enough demand unless you partner with existing governments or enterprises that already have millions of users and uh, and they, they 
are onboard, they onboard their millions of users to the blockchain system. Um, so using Vala as an example, of uh, they partner with governments to onboard millions of users instead of going directly to the migrants or groups like Distributed ID based in Toronto and one of our portfolio companies that instead of trying to onboard an identity network is partnering with Chinese banks with millions of users to onboard the millions, millions of users to, the, to, their, to their identity network. Um, and then a story of, of how I think blockchains are, are supporting social initiatives. So I was just in Vancouver at the launch of the Silicon Valley Blockchain Society Vancouver chapter and there was a group called Unify.org that was presenting. Uh, basically, Unify.org organizes and coordinates the largest global peace movements in the world, um, and they're very tied into the blockchain community. Um, and so, one of the reasons why I specifically got into blockchains and why a big part of our business at MLG is creating global communities and network effects, identifying champions in every country and city of the world to be able to um, lead movements in, in countries and cities of the world. Um, one of the reasons why I got into blockchains and, and structured a business like this is to be able to create global movements on a significantly lower budget than is required from, from a business that does not have people all over the place. Um, and to be able to partner with groups like Unify.org and amplify their message through our distribution network. Um, so uh, yeah, Unify.org, super cool. Thank you. I have a very simple answer for this. I'm not, I don't want to sell anything, but however, use Boosto Influencer Network, it's free. Push your projects out there, use the influencers who use their local language, their local culture, to tell their local followers about your projects for free. It's really simple. Thank you, fellow panelists. Thank you for the organizers, by the way, for this amazing event. And uh, see you around. Cool, thank you. Yes. Once again, thank you, Gal, and all the, pre uh, all the panelists on the presentation today. Michael, thanks for stepping in as well, too.